Medical examiner Dr. K. Scarpetta is back in Identity Unknown. It's the latest in the long-running series of novels by Patricia Cornwell. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Patricia Cornwell is an internationally best-selling author. She's written three other fiction series as well as nonfiction books, but she's perhaps best known as the author of the K. Scarpetta series. And she joins us to talk about the 28th novel to feature that character. Patricia, welcome to Some Books Considered. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, this is another novel in the long-running series featuring K. Scarpetta. And this time, things take an otherworldly turn, at least at first. There are suspicions. Tell us about the plot here. Well, I started this book with the question, what fills me full of wonder these days? Because I, I think about that for every book that I start, because I'm going to be spending an awful lot of time on that story. And, you know, there's been an awful lot in the news about UAPs, better known as UFOs, and the whole notion of, is there life in the universe besides us? Is there even non-human um, intelligent life here um, that may be even among us. Who knows? I mean, there's so many stories out there these days. And I started thinking, what would Scarpetta do if she had a case that might involve a UFO, so to speak, or a UAP? In other words, you know, you hear these stories about someone being abducted and dropped out of a flying saucer. And it sounds very silly, but <clears throat> I started playing around with that from a scientific standpoint about what would she do. And so we have a scene where she's out in the middle of nowhere. There's this body that's been dropped clearly from a height. Um, there's a crop circle of flower petals around the body from the flowering trees. You know, some vortex has created this. And, and also there's evidence of perhaps radiation exposure because of the reddish tint of the victim's skin. Then to add to that, this is someone she knows, a famous astrophysicist that she had a relationship with long ago when she was getting started, when they got to know each other in Italy for a summer. So all of this becomes a very layered story. And I can promise you <clears throat> without giving away anything that that all is with the, within the realm of possibility. It, it um, you know, I'm not, this is not science fiction. You're not going to have aliens running around ray gunning people or something like that but this is what if and then there's a logical and scientific and rather horrific explanation i might add for what really happened here but i do want to open up the question to my audience of are we alone um i don't think we are i don't believe we're the only intelligent life in the world or in the universe in fact i certainly hope not um cuz i'd like to think that there's something smarter than us out there but so that, again, I like to let Scarpetta take a stab at mysteries that we all wonder about. And it does start out as a mystery. And Lucy uh, traces the path of this UFO, and that's how she discovers the body. And then Marino's definitely on board with the idea of there being extraterrestrials. He, he's all in on that. So... The evidence seems to mount one direction, but as you point out, Kay Scarpetta has to look at it differently and figure out, you know, what, what's really going on here. And the other thing, and this is how you start the novel, there's another story going on with the death of a little girl. And that is intertwined throughout the story because of different connections like where the body was found, etc., well, you know, I have to say, even though it was, it's always hard writing a book, this one was a lot of fun because I love exploring all of that and the whole notion of a moon dust like substance that is a trace evidence that shows up. And um, I mean, everything makes you, and then the, the top secret facility that, that Scarpetta is whisked away to at Langley Air Force Base, where she's taken into this very strange off limits place to do this autopsy. And when she walks in, you know, some morgues have drawers for the bodies and, and instead of cool, big coolers. They have cooler drawers. And and I've seen those, and, and it's not that unusual. But when she walks into this place, the drawers that fill the wall, like an old post office, you know, these big boxes, they're not the normal size for human beings. And she's wondering, what goes on in this place? And so you can see for yourself what goes on in that place. But I will also say that even when I'm telling you the flashback of when she was working in a museum, a pathology museum, and came across a secret file for Roswell, I actually had the same thing happen to me. 
when I was in that same museum in a back storage area, uh, looking at the artifacts from Abraham Lincoln's assassination, looking at the piece of his skull and the bullet. And while I was standing there, I noticed one of the drawers was all taped up and it had a big red label on it. It said, do not open. And I got a little closer to see what it was and it, the little label on it said Roswell. And I pointed at it to the curator and said, um, what's this? And she said, oh, that's just a joke. But you know, to this day, she didn't seem to act like it was one. And I'm not so sure. I mean, it wasn't an area where the public's allowed to go. And, and it may have been a joke. I don't know. But I am very curious about this whole subject. And um, I'm not afraid of it. People are what scare me, not, not maybe life from another planet. It's, the, it's us that scare me. Well, you talk about the autopsy that she does there. And the autopsy makes this even stranger because she comes across things she doesn't suspect that she's going to find, but can be a big clue to solving the case. She definitely isn't expecting to find what she finds. Um, you know, when she sees the body at the scene, she already has a good idea what killed her, her friend. Um, she can tell from the blunt force trauma, and, and she can even tell what side he hit on when he fell from a height. So she has a really good idea of, of how he died, the, you know, the mechanism of it. But then when she opens him up, and particularly, and we won't give away too much, but particularly when she looks to see what's in his stomach, she finds something that she is certainly not expecting. And it pulls her into the story in an even deeper way, because in some ways it might just have to do with her. Well, as you pointed out, you write these novels in part because you're exploring things that are of her interest to you, things that capture your imagination. And uh, so tell us a bit about the research for this book, you, you know, because you take us to NASA. Of course, you talk about the latest in forensic medicine. So tell us about what you do to make sure these books ring true. Well, you know, I've spent a good bit of time at NASA Langley in, in Hampton, Virginia, um, and also Langley Air Force Base, which is right next to NASA Langley. And I've, I've been both places many times and done a lot of research. And, and so I set this top secret facility there, having a pretty good idea of what goes on in both places. Um, you know, but remember, this is fiction, but it doesn't mean it's not plausible. That facility at Langley, I've not actually seen if it really exists, but I would not be surprised if a facility like this doesn't exist somewhere, because if there are unusual remains that are found with aircraft or spacecraft that we don't quite understand, if any of that is true, it's the forensic, the you know, armed forces forensic pathologists who would respond to something like that. And I know those people and I know what they do. They're also the ones who, you know, handled the body recoveries when the Columbia Space Shuttle disintegrated. I mean, that's who gets deployed. And so, you know, what I show you is how things would work and you can decide for yourself what you believe. But when I went to the Green Bank Telescope, which I talk about in this book, and the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia is quite amazing. It's as tall as, as the Statue of Liberty and about 100 feet wide. And it is tracking things in the most far flung areas of our universe. Um, it, it's light years and light years away what it's picking up on. And when I was there, and I was watching the astronomers in the control room working this massive thing because it's movable. They're tracking something, the, the, one of the Voyager probes. And I, I said to each one of them, I said, do you believe there's life out there? There's life beyond us, intelligent life. And they said, absolutely. For one thing, it's a, it's a mathematical, statistical improbability that we are all there is. You know, when, when the solar system was just the planets that, that we knew about as children, you know, the ones in our solar system, we didn't know about what else was out there. But now because of the Hubble telescope, the Webb telescope, and just the technologies in general, we know there are thousands of, of planets outside of our solar system. I mean, you've seen photographs and it's mind boggling how much. And so the, the likelihood that we are all there is is really remote, if not almost impossible. And, and not just my opinion, the opinion of a lot of people. I mean, there's even a mathematical equation called the Drake equation that, that deals with that very probability. So I think it's good to open our minds up to that because that you know, might make you think differently about yourself and what's expected of you. And if there's higher life forms in ourselves, then we should aspire to be better. 
I'm talking with Patricia Cornwell about Identity Unknown, and our conversation continues in a moment. If you're enjoying this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. And thank you. And one of the interesting points that you make in the book is that if it were ever confirmed that there is extraterrestrial life, and that life took a human life, there's really no legal precedent to deal with that. We know what to do if a human kills a human, but what happens if that comes from a life someplace else? Well, you know, that just adds to the whole thing that I'm showing you here, because the case itself would have to be worked differently because the that we don't know what we're dealing with. Anatomically, you don't know what you're dealing with. You don't know what you're being exposed to in terms of radiation or bacteria or viruses that, um, that, that are not indigenous to this planet. And so in it, then you've got the legal system absolutely is not prepared for such a thing. It's like when I explored in the last book, I explored what would happen if Bigfoot killed somebody. And Bigfoot didn't, by the way, I'm not going, don't go looking around, shoot Bigfoot. He didn't do anything, but if there were a death like that, that's just, that's considered an accident. It's no different than if you got attacked by a bear. That's the way that would be viewed. And legally, probably if it's a non, if there were a non-human um, intelligent being that killed one of us, there, it would not be a homicide. Um, you know, I suspect at first it would be classified as an accident because we don't have a law to deal with that. And, and just for the record, I am, I'm not worried about extraterrestrials killing us. By the way, if they are out there, if they're in range, they, they could have done it a long time ago, um, especially if they had the technologies that we suspect they might. So, um, but, but you raise a fascinating question. When, and I don't even say if, but when the day comes, the general public has a confirmation that we are not the only intelligent life in the universe whether we have some kind of communication or a visit, I don't know. Um, We will have to rethink a lot of things. We'll have to rethink everything, actually. As you mentioned, this is another, and I think it's, uh, if I'm counting correctly, the 28th novel to feature Kay Scarpetta. So she's been at this for a while. How has she changed over the years? Well, she's changed the way the rest of us have. You know, if you live in the real world, and I try to keep her rooted in the real world, just our biological clock, The way we change as we get older, our perceptions, you know, hopefully we have more experience, more wisdom, are a little more flexible because we've been around the block a few times. At the same time, the the ecosystem that we live in, the world that we inhabit now is, is very different from the one that, you know, I was writing about when I started doing this research in the 1980s, which now seems like the Stone Age. So, and that shapes us. Um, You know, I know that that writing about this in time passing, I have certainly changed. You know, I'm not the same person I was when I was writing postmortem. So I evolved Scarpetta the way the rest of us would. And frankly, I think she's more interesting now. She has a lot more dimension to her, I think, in the modern stories um, than in even then in the earlier ones, because I know her better. And she's been through a whole lot more. I recently read that Amazon Prime has green-lighted two seasons of a series that's going to feature Kay Scarpetta. Tell us about how that came about. Well, that that is such good news. I mean, I'm so happy about this. And, it, and it, if it wasn't for Jamie Lee Curtis, it would not have happened. Um, I'm a friend, you know, I'm happy to say she's a friend of mine. And four years ago, when I did two space thrillers, which is how the beginning of my getting so interested in all things outer space um, we were talking about, she was getting into production and we talked about whether the space series might be something for TV. And, and then she said, you know what, what I'm really, what about Scarpetta? What's going on with her? And I said, well, actually she's not under option right this minute. And so she said, you know what, I'm going to look into that. So she has been the champion for this. And that is why it's where it is. And because of her, how huge she is, she's attracted all kinds of star power. I mean, Nicole Kidman is going to play Scarpetta. You know, Jamie is playing Dorothy, the sister. And we have um, Ariana DeBose, another Oscar winner, who is playing Lucy. And, um, and of course, uh, Bobby Cannavale. And he's, I, I've always loved him. And he's going to be an awesome Reno. So they start filming this month. 
and we will see it on TV next year. So it's it's really exciting. It's been a long time coming. Video, TV, films are a different medium from a book. So how do you feel about Scarpetta being translated into this different medium? You know, sometimes it feels a little weird because I get to scripts and I'll read through it and I'll say, wait a minute. And, you know, this this says that Marino's never been married before. Yes, he has. And, 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 and then I start thinking, but some of these things that are slight deviations away from something that I wrote, um, in the long run, they don't matter because a lot of them people don't remember anyway. Some of them I don't even remember. But you have to remember for sure that, it, as you so wisely pointed out, you are adapting one art form to another. And whether it's a film or a TV show or even a Broadway musical, um, it's not going to be the same as the books because it can't be and it shouldn't be. But you will, when you see the show, um, you will definitely feel the bones of my stories. You will feel the reverberations of that world. You will, it will feel familiar for sure. And you know, uh, you're, you're going to recognize the story in post mortem in the first season, and also um, elements of the book Autopsy that came out four years ago because we're dealing with two timelines. And um, but you're also going to get some things you don't get from my books. Some of the backstory, some of the. Um, the scenes where the where Scarpetta is not present and you don't see what Marino's doing when he goes home to Dorothy or you don't see what Lucy's doing when nobody's looking. And those are the things that I think my fans are going to enjoy. And I'm looking forward to these characters being inhabited by these wonderful actors. Uh, they're going to bring a richness to it. And I, I they actually think it will be good for me. Uh, I, I've already when I'm writing about Dorothy, I can't help but see Jamie Lee Curtis. And that's been true for the last two books, including this one. And it's made her such a better character. I mean, I love it. I'll start laughing out loud. Well, this book is Identity Unknown. And I'm assuming, but tell me if I'm wrong here, or maybe there's more to that title, but i assuming that refers to the UFO. It's the, you don't know the identity at the beginning of the book. No, we sure don't. We And, and that is literally true that... This thing comes up as a UAP or a UFO, but you've got to remember, it's like drug testing. If you have a designer drug that we, we create a drug screen for in the laboratory so that we know that this person was on that particular designer drug, but if you change the molecular structure of that, even very in a very minor way, then the drug screen's not going to pick it up anymore, but that doesn't mean there's nothing there. And so you could pick up a UAP on sensors and radar, and it's not identified, but it's like that drug screen. It may be that whatever that is, is not in a database, but it doesn't, I mean, for example, some top secret technologies that the military has probably are not in the normal database. So it doesn't mean it's from outer space, so to speak, but it also doesn't mean that it's not. It could be either. And I think that a lot of the UAPs and UFOs that people are seeing these days and videoing, you know, recording, probably a number of them are artifact or ex or perhaps drone technology that you're not familiar with. There's a lot of very strange drones flying around, but there are some that that we don't seem to have an explanation for because the technologies that these people are witnessing or that we're seeing on these sensors, those technologies don't seem like something that humans are able to do. We're not able, it's beyond us to have something move the way some of these strange objects in the sky move. So I like to keep my mind open and say, maybe it is something that humans didn't make. And if so, I think that's amazing. Patricia, what can readers look forward to next? Well, you know, I'm working on a new Scarpetta now. And of course, it will be a very human story because they always are, no matter what other little fun things I throw in there. And this time, I'm going to explore another mystery, which is the whole notion of ghosts and what Scarpetta does if there seems to be something like that associated with a crime that happens in a very old place. And as always, you will find there will be a scientific explanation for everything that you see, and it's all within the realm of possibility, and the technologies I'm showing you are absolutely real. Um, you know, the I've, I have always believed that magic is simply unexplained science. And so that's what's fun with this is, is to take the paranormal and to show you how it could be real. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that we understand some of these things we're seeing, and it doesn't mean that they're all manufactured by humans, because chances are they're not. The novel is Identity Unknown by Patricia Cornwell. Patricia, thank you for talking with me today. Well, thank you. It's been loads of fun, as always. If you'd like to purchase Identity Unknown, I've placed a link for you in the description below. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. Meanwhile, here are two other interviews you might find interesting. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.